The conflict in Ukraine enters its second month, and Moscow has already been the target of harsh and wide-ranging sanctions. Russian exports are severely curtailed, and the ruble plunged after Russia was cut off from SWIFT. Europe is, however, feeling the pinch, too, with volatile oil and gas prices while ramping up its defense spending. It now looks like Russia is giving Europe a taste of its own medicine with dramatic consequences for the global commodity markets and the world economy. Can this looming energy crisis be prevented? And are we in for the long haul? To answer some of these questions, we're joined now by Liu Xia, founder and CEO of Cloud Hands Trading. And also here in Beijing is current affairs commentator Einar Tangen. Welcome to both of you to the hub on CGTN. Uh, Lucia, let me go to you first. One month into the conflict, what do you see as the biggest economic fallout from the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Morning, everyone. Uh, actually, before the war, we've seen the um, global economy has been in a difficult situation already, um, like the high inflation, the flyer of the energy crisis, and the tighter food supply. And after the war, um, the U.S. and EU has put in some uh, pressures, um, for example, the sanctions um, on Russia um, to crippling the Russian economy. And also, I think uh, the price is not only paid by the Russian and um, also by U.S., EU and our countries. So uh, the cost is, for example, the worsen of the global supply chain uh, from the uh, high tech um, some raw important materials to um, transportation and energy market. So um, as China is a big player in the global market, China has been affected by all this um, negatively. But at the same time, I see there is a chance of China playing a different role in the global payment system and in the role of the um, new global economy. So um, for example, Russia has been the dollarizing for years. And um, after the SWIFT um, sanctions, dollar um, is um, not the uh, first choice by Russian. So I've seen um, Saudi Arabian is considering using yuan to pay oil. So I've seen there's a good side and a bad side to China. All right, Einar, what do you see, what do you identify as the biggest economic fallout that no one wants to see from this crisis in Ukraine? Well, I mean, uh, unlike the... Uh you know, what happened with the financial meltdown. What you have today is, you know, people lost their homes, they lost their savings. In today's environment, they're talking about food and energy. You cannot live without food and you cannot run a country or an economy without energy. So at this time, I mean, you're, you're looking at existential threats to uh, countries, not only uh, Ukraine, but if you look around the world, all the developing worlds are loaded with debt. They were never uh, given enough vaccines. Um, they just don't have anything. And these higher prices are going to push them over the top. It's not just about higher prices. There are actual shortages, and we all know who's going to pay in the end when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the downstream industries, the consumers, uh, everyone, you know, uh, cannot, uh, no one can escape from this crisis. Um, so, Lucia, let me go back to you. If the war drags on for another month or months, how bad will global economy suffer? And in particular, how do you foresee the Chinese economy to be impacted? Mm -hmm. Uh, this week, actually, we see a uh, bounce in the market after there are some good rumors about the market comes out, saying the Russian is um, reducing radically about their um, some of the actions and also some good news from the Ukraine side. The market takes these rumors as, as a good news. So I think that in the short term, the sentiment is a little bit settled down compared to in the um, previous weeks. But in the medium term, I think um, no real good news comes out. Right, right, because we did see that global markets rebounded. Some markets even rallied on the news of a potential breakthrough uh, yes. on the side of the negotiations, right? So uh, is it safe to say that what will happen to global markets depend largely on the progress of Number one, the war situation on the battlefield, and number two, on the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, what happened now is like um, uh, just a short-term bond. I, I don't see um, the market funds is ground or have a V-shape um, rebound in the stock market. So I think now it's more like people have been so tired about the, all the news, negative news coming coming out, and traders take it as a uh, buying the rumor, selling the truth. 
So when the um, real news coming out, people will be considering the medium term and longer term effect afterwards. So that might not be a real good news to the market. Hmm, I know. What do you think? Well, I mean, for, for China, there's a lot of things. First off, uh, people should know that China has some of the largest uh, reserves of food out there in terms of wheat, corn, etc. I mean, literally, over 50% of the uh, available wheat reserves are in China. China was pre uh, preparing not for this occasion, but they saw that there was food was going to be uh, an issue yeah. uh, coming out of the pandemic, and they have been wisely uh, stockpiling. So it's not going to hit China as hard, but there are, is going to be this kind of letdown in global demand. I mean, you, you, you cannot have these kind of consequences. And it could get worse, especially in the commodities areas, if, if in fact, the Ukrainians are not able to harvest their winter wheat crop. And then after that, if they're not able to uh, plant in the spring planting season. This removes all of what they've done. Now, this is not just about wheat and corn. Edible oils, sunflower oil, over 50% comes uh, from Ukraine and Russia. So you're really looking at a whole bunch of shortages, not only there, but steel, automotive parts. This is going to really dig deep into uh, everybody, including especially Europe. So at this time, uh, everyone's kind of looking at how long this is going to go. And unfortunately, the negotiation table does not look good. I mean, you see some progress, but not enough. Yeah, we know that a lot of countries are commodities importing countries, right? So they, their economy and the, the livelihood of their residents depend largely on uh, the capacity, the capability of Russia and Ukraine to export wheat, for example, among other commodities. And the World Bank even predicted that if the war drags on, many countries and the residents in many countries can fall back into poverty. Well, look at a place like Egypt. 60, uh, bread is a staple, and it's at every single meal. 60% of the wheat comes uh, from Russia. Uh, the issue there is that Russia can to continue to supply wheat, uh, but it's going to cost more. And quite frankly, there's a question of how it's paid. Because although Egypt is not joining in on the sanctions list, the U.S. has uh, signaled that it will go after anybody in any country that uh, violates what it thinks are uh, its unilateral rules for the, uh, the world economy, economy. Okay, Lisa, let me go back to you. The OPEC Plus meetings will take place on Thursday. Do you think the ministers will somehow decide to raise output? And if so, by how much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has been watching really closely to this meeting. After the um, yeah, Russian invasion on, of Ukraine, uh, U.S. and EU has been putting pressures um, repetitively urge OPEC to rise uh, oil production. But over the past weeks, I don't think they, they have the attitude to do so. And in this meeting, I don't expect any news to coming out um, saying they want to um, rise oil production. And actually, in the energy market, um, it's formed by big players. And now, um, EU and the US are taking actions to reduce their reliance on Russian energy and Russian oils. So I think um, the, the uh, new pressures in the energy market will depend on how uh, soon or how much EU can cut their reliance on Russian energy, rather um, um, expecting some news from the OPEC. So I think in the end, um, we, are, um, we want to see the um, energy prices settle down, coming down, but it all depends on how the big players um, place in this energy battlefield. So, Anir, what are you watching for for this OPEC Plus meeting? I'm less concerned about oil. I mean, oil is somewhat fungible. If the oil isn't flowing uh, to Europe, it's going to flow to the east, to the, to the countries that uh, do not have sanctions. But gas is another thing. You cannot switch it on and off. I mean, you need specialized uh, facilities to liquefy it down to negative 165 uh, centigrade. Then you have to ship it at the same temperature, and then you have to have a receiving station. All that costs billions of dollars. Each one of these uh, tankers, and they figure they need about 80 of them, would cost $500 million. All right? That does not include the facilities for liquefying and also receiving. You're talking about uh, you know, a lot of money, getting towards a trillion dollars uh, to get all of this uh, stuff rerouted. So that, and th that's going to take years to happen. So at this juncture, it's less about oil, except as oil as a substitute. You cannot convert 
uh, gas turbines to oil burners very easily, and it'll take months or even years, and it's very expensive. You know, the Europe, the EU, has been saying that it wants to cut off its reliance on the Russian energy. The EU imported, uh, here are some figures, 40% of its natural gas from Russia, and about a quarter of European oil and petroleum products came from Russia before the war in Ukraine. Do you think somehow the U.S. can uh, fill in the vacuum as Washington promised? No. <laughs> Frankly, I mean, it's impossible. I mean, to, as I said, on the gas end of it, uh, you're talking about three or four years minimum, and right now all the shipyards are full. If you're talking about oil, the U.S. cannot ramp up production enough to satisfy what uh, Europe needs. So this is a situation where, uh, you know, you hear all these pronouncements, Europe and the U.S. talking about how to get off reliance. But the fact is you can't flip a switch and turn off 30 percent of your total energy production and switch it to somewhere else. There's not enough capacity. Well, well, Liu Xia, given the energy crisis, the geopolitics, um, and also potentially an energy shortage, are you seeing a transition in Europe or other parts of the world? Um, perhaps they're thinking to uh, fast, fasten the process of transitioning off fossil fuel and into renewable energy? Um, the coal and traditional energies um, have been... Um, much more reliance on Russian, um, so it's very hard for them to transit to the renewable energy in the short term. And also we see the transition um, caused some problems last year, um, which caused the energy prices growing so much up in the short, short term. Um, so I think um, it can't be done in the short term, I'm saying within one or two years. All right, Einar, let's talk about the supply chains. Russia is not a huge economy but it's still pretty much relevant, uh, however you look at it. How do you think the conflict has impacted the global supply chains, which, which was already strained uh, because of COVID? I've talked to people in the shipping industry and uh, prices are just going up and will continue to go up. Just remember that if you're not importing your wheat from Russia, that means you're probably going to get it from the United States or Brazil. That means that you need ocean-going um, you know, haulers to do that, and those are already filled. So you're looking at a, an acute shipping uh, supply deficit at a time when you have essentials. These aren't things you can say, well, it's you know, watches. I don't need another um, you know, Apple watch. This is something where you actually need food. So this, this is becoming a critical issue, which has been largely ignored by the US and the EU as they struggle to take care of themselves. But they're basically throwing everyone else, especially developing countries, into the water. Yeah, especially if you think about uh, the prospect of a potential uh, Cold War after the hot war in Ukraine. You know, the financial sanctions, counter sanctions, uh, the trade barriers, uh, you know, non-tariff barriers between NATO and Russia, things can get a lot worse. Well, they can. You know, what's interesting about this is you have the two richest areas, uh, you know, Europe and America, apart from, you know, uh, Korea and, and Japan. And they're going to use a, a substantial amount of their wealth, uh, basically closing their doors. Remember, if you produce something in the U.S. and it costs you $15 an hour to uh, have an employee versus 50 cents an hour in other places like Bangladesh, all right, there's just no way that you can compete. Uh, you cannot sell your products overseas. And the overseas products are prevented from coming in. So your consumers pay more and you become less uh, competitive. So this is going to be a kind of downward spiral for both the U.S. and Europe if they continue this kind of Cold War uh, mentality on the economic front. For sure, for sure. Lu Xia, how do you look at the challenges facing global supply chains? Uh, after the war, or the war breaks out, I see the, um, for example, um, the wars in, in the global supply chain in some high-tech products, um, important raw materials, and I think it will last longer than we expected even after um, the, the war, as you said, the globalization might have end. And we, um, we are looking for um, some potential opportunities to have a new globalization, which might lead by China and lead by some digital economies. So um, this gives us a new chance to find a new role in the supply chain, in the global economy. 
Yeah, that was you know really leading up to my next question because many policy experts predict a dual Cold War situation, uh, like Reiner mm -hmm. and I have been talking about after the Ukraine crisis. There can be a Cold War between NATO and Russia, and also the, the one launched by the U.S. against China. Uh, do you think all this may end globalization as we know it? Um, I think now we are entering a new phase of globalization, which is leading by the digital economy. And also China is playing a different role in this new um, globalization. Um, so I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the, the um, disruptions in the um, global supply chain caused by the war and also the new chances coming out. For example, um, we are building some of the threats in the high tech uh, field and also we are driving some changes in the internet industry. So I see maybe a new globalization is shaping after this war. Einer, uh, what do you think? I mean, uh, are we going to see uh, a different version of globalization? Not a different one. What you see is the decline of globalization and the rise of regionalization. I mean, you start looking at the RCEP, the Belt and Road, the TCTPP. Uh, these are all uh, efforts to try to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the downfall of WTO because the U.S. will not allow any um, appellate judges to be appointed. So uh, countries are going to band together. I'm, I'm a little bit more helpful. I think we're on the point of crisis. And at that point, uh, countries are going to have to come together or face dire consequences and create a better world order. Otherwise, there's going to be real problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's consumers and uh, average ordinary citizens who are feeling the pinch. Uh, thank you very much, Lucia, and thank you, Einer. Thank you both very much for joining us at this hour. And they will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. What you think matters? Send us a message on Weibo, Douyin, or other social media platforms. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wang Wen. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.